We're in the book of Galatians. <clears throat> I want to start a study in, in uh, Galatians. Um, let's just read the first few verses to get us going. Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you, and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, we want to look at the book of Galatians. Within it is contained um, the good news, and what Paul does is he prevents us from falling into an understanding of a false gospel. So he's going to attack the fa a false gospel that was infiltrating the church, and so we'll work through this letter and see the implications of what the false gospel does and how we as Christians should live under the true gospel. And so as you look you know, around and kind of see what's going on in our world today, it's becoming more and more difficult to find good news, right? But the person that has put his trust in Christ, Paul would say, as their Savior, has found the true essence of good news. Uh, so the New Testament refers to this good news as the gospel. Paul, writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, says, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried. He rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. And all that he, he considers to be the good news of the Gospel. So the good news is that sinners can be forgiven. Uh, they can spend eternity with their, their Creator because of what Christ did upon the cross. And so the good news of salvation through faith in Christ is really the most important message that we can give and deliver to the world. Uh, so much so, this message takes even the most hardened of sinners. Uh, Paul would be testimony to this. This message would change even the most hardened of sinners. It changed Paul's life. And through Paul, uh, this very same message changed others. You consider the, the, the state of the Roman Empire as Paul takes and introduces the gospel into the Roman Empire. Uh, he had an impact on, on the Roman Empire through the gospel proclamation. And so Paul's purpose in this letter is to defend the gospel from attacks uh, from false gospels. And so he'll have some very strong language to use against those who would um, come in and, and, and try to alter the gospel in any kind of way. Uh, Merrill C. Tenney wrote this uh, in Galatians, uh, wrote this about Galatians. He said this, Christianity might have been a just one more Jewish sect and the thought of the Western world might have been entirely pagan had it never been written. Galatians embodies the, uh, the germinal teachings on Christian freedom which separated Christianity from Judaism and which launched it upon a career of missionary conquest. It was the cornerstone of the Protestant Reformation because of its teachings of salvation by grace alone became the dominant theme of the preaching of the Reformers. And so we've got to continue to remember uh, to, to, to push Reformation by teaching salvation by grace alone. And so as we go through this letter, we're going to see that he is absolutely right about his statements. MacArthur, writing about Galatians, says, The message of Galatians is the message of Christian spiritual freedom, his deliverance by Christ from the bondage of sin and religious legalism. And this is so relevant in our day because we hear this thing about, well, I've got Christian liberty or we've got freedoms and this sort of stuff. But we need to define what we're free from, right? We're not free from serving God. We're not free from submitting to God. We're free from the bondage and tyranny of sin. And so I think the message of Galatians is relevant in our day. Uh, this whole concept of personal freedom has become a dominant theme really within a lot of the philosophies that are out there both inside and outside of the church. But always remember this. The biblical definition of freedom uh, and, and these secular philosophies are completely on opposite sides of the spectrum. Freedom in the Bible is the ability and the desire to be able to do what I ought to do. That's biblical freedom. Biblical freedom is the ability and desire to be able to do what I ought to do. So a lot of times you're going to come into uh, the, the local compromising Christian and he's going to try to justify his compromising. I have Christian liberty and you don't, right? Well, if what they're doing is sin, there is no liberty to sin ever. And here's the thing when it comes to freedom. The unregenerate does not have freedom. They don't desire to glorify God. And because they don't desire to glorify God, they don't glorify God. And so this kind of person in the Bible is typically referred to as a fool, but freedom is not liberty to do whatever your flesh wants to do. So when Christ frees us, it means that he, by the Holy Spirit, enables us to please God. And, and, and through the Spirit, giving us a, you know, we're new creations in Christ. Uh, he gives us desires that want to please our Heavenly Father. And so we're going to 
develop this theme more and more as we work through the book of Galatians. Now, anytime you, you go into a new book study, it's always good to address a couple questions or several questions. Number one, who wrote the letter? Number two, who was the letter of Galatians addressed to? Who was it written to? And then number three, and this is really important, why did the author pick up the pen and write the letter to begin with? What was the, the crisis? What was going on? What, what made him stop doing what he was doing and write a letter? So before we get started, let's address some of these questions because I think it's going to help us answer uh, the more tedious questions that come up as, as we go through the book. Now, as we go through this introductory information um, over the next several weeks, I'd like for you guys to just enjoy reading the book. Spend some time in six chapters. Shouldn't take you that long to go through it. But, but as we prepare for our study, just read through it each day. Uh, just read through it once from beginning to end uh, so that you have a better appreciation of the flow of thought. This will get you familiar with the Bible or with, with this particular book. All right. So let's talk about the author. We need to understand who the author is so that we can, you know, um, we can learn about how he views things such as the gospel. One said it this way. The writing will be as worth as much as the author is worth. For only insofar as he is recognized as appointed and inspired by God will his writings carry revelation authority. So let's look at it. If you look at the beginning of the letter, it says, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. All right, so the first thing we see is the, the letter simply starts off by Paul. So do we really know that Paul penned this letter? And I think the answer is yes. I think there's both internal and external evidence to support Paul's authorship of this particular letter. The internal evidence is, um, you know, there Paul says it, right? Verse 1. You don't have to be a biblical scholar to understand that one. The author identifies himself as Paul. Uh, turn to Galatians 5. Look at verse 2. Galatians 5, verse 2. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. Well, once again, Paul identifies himself as writing this letter. But not only does the author of this letter identify himself or refer to himself within the letter... Galatians is characteristic of Paul's vocabulary, his style, and the content that he normally writes. So let me give you a couple. Of, let me just give you an example of this. In Galatians two sixteen, notice what he writes: Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Does that sound familiar to you? Turn to chapter 3, look at verse 11. Galatians 3, 11. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Now hold that thought and turn over to Romans 3. Just hold your place here in Galatians. We'll come right back. Listen to how uh, Romans 3, verse 20 writes. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And, and notice down there when you get to verse 27, where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. So over and over again, you're seeing some, some um, commonality in this, this type of language. But this is one example of a consistent theme that is found in the writings of Paul. Uh, we could go through all these comparisons that could be made, but, but I'm going to leave that to you. Go, go find a good commentary on the book of Galatians and you'll begin to see they all go through this exercise of where they look at how Paul writes consistently throughout his letter. So there, there's not only the, the internal evidence that you know Paul identifies himself as the author of, of Galatians, but there's a writing style that's consistent not only with just that phrase we use, but other phrases and language that Paul would use in other letters. All right. And because so many of the New Testament books were authored by Paul, if you read through his letters, you're going to pick up his very unique style of writing. In addition to the Paul, you know, what they call the Pauline style, the letter contains some autobiographical um, information about the author. Look at verse, uh, turn to Galatians 1. Look at verse 11. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former conduct of Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my father. 
But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him fifteen days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed, before God, I do not lie. Afterward I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea which were in Christ. But they were all hearing only. He who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they glorify God in me. Well, the author is providing all this personal information about himself, and we can go and verify some of these facts, particularly over in the book of Acts. And then the final piece of evidence I'll show you is found in chapter 6. Turn to Galatians 6 and um, look at verse 17. From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear the, my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, all one has to do is read through the Corinthian letters or read through the book of Acts to realize uh, Paul would definitely bear the marks of, of being a follower of Christ uh, because he, he did truly suffer for Christ's sake. Uh, the only thing I would get you to think of as we go through this letter um, is that the author has a genuine concern for these churches. And so as we go uh, through the book of Galatians, Paul is going to use um, some really strong language against anything that goes against the true gospel. Uh, he's not doing this because he hates these readers, but he's confronting them about how fast they're turning to a false gospel because he has a genuine love and concern for them. And so he desires to maintain the purity of the gospel that he was made a steward of. So there's some internal evidence here that teaches us that uh, Paul was, was really the author. But there's some external evidence as well. The external evidence also helps us confirm Paul's authorship. Polycarp, uh, in his letter to the Philippians, contains a quote from, Galatia, uh, from Galatians 4.26 and Galatians 6.7. Uh, early, other early church fathers such as Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, Justin Martyr, Origen quote from the letters of Galatians in their work, and they give credit to the Apostle Paul uh, for authoring this letter. The Moratorian Canon, uh, this council got together in 200 AD, and within this council they list the books of the New Testament, and they give Paul credit for writing uh, these pastoral epistles. So we're pretty confident, we're pretty sure, that the Apostle Paul actually wrote the book of Galatians. So what do we know about the author? What does the Bible teach us about this man? Well, if you go back to Galatians 1, this verse teaches you quite a bit about him. Uh, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So this verse reveals many things to us about the apostle Paul. Number one, we see his calling. He was called to be an apostle. And um, when you read this word apostle, we need to talk about this for just a second. Um, there's three ideas that we get from the Bible. There's three ways this word apostle is used. Okay, And this is important because there are these different denominations out there that like to claim they have apostles uh, within their church. So we need to ask ourselves, do we have any apostles here? Well, it depends on how you use the word. right? So let's see how the Bible uses the word apostle. Number one, there's a general sense in which the word apostle is used. The word apostle is sometimes used in a general sense. In other words, that would include all Christians because the word apostle simply means sent one. It comes from the Greek word apostolos. Um, and and uh, in, um, in, one of the, uh, in Strong's, this is what he had to say. It, it talks about a delegate, specifically an ambassador of the gospel. Okay? So a lot of times this word apostle is translated apostle or apostolos is, is translated apostle or messenger or he that is sent. Vines comes to this word and said apostolos means one sent forth. So let's look at a couple things just to kind of pull this out because when you hear the word apostle you're probably thinking about those key guys that have real authority from God but this word is used all over the New Testament and it's not necessarily addressing those fellows. Uh, for example, turn to Hebrews 3.1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. So in, in this case, that word apostle, that's our word. Jesus was the one sent by the Father. right? So he was an apostle in that sense because he was sent by the Father. Turn over to Matthew 28. 
we're kind of familiar with this one. We, we go to it quite a bit. But notice here in Matthew 28, we as Christians are sent. Look at verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. Amen. So we see here that we've been sent by Jesus to proclaim the gospel message. So in a general sense, all Christians are apostles in, in, in the sense that we are all sent to the nations to go and, and share the gospel to all we come into contact with. Well, there's a more special <coughs> there's a more specialized use of the word. The word apostle is used in a more special sense, and we think of the apostle used in, in maybe in our more uh, modern day use, we would think of missionaries. So let me give you some examples of this. Go to Acts 14. Acts 14. Acts 14, verse 14. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard this, they tore their clothes and ran among the multitude, crying out. Now, notice here, I think we're okay. We all kind of agree Paul has a very special use of the word apostle. But what about Barnabas? I mean, do we put Barnabas on the same plane as, um, say, Peter? Right? Well, he's called an apostle. But notice their story really begins back in Acts 13. Acts 13, 1 says this. Now when the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, uh, who is called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, uh, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed, laid hands on them, and notice they sent them away. So we see here these men are sent off. Uh, verse 3, we would think of this idea of being sent off as missionaries. Later in, in, in Acts 14, Luke records and refers to them, and he used that word um, apostolos to, to refer to them. They had been sent out by the church. Let me give you another one to, to consider. Um, turn to Romans 16. Romans 16. And look at verse 7. Greet. Andronicus and Junia, my countrymen and fellow prisoners who are, more, who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Um, you may not be familiar with the apostle Junius and Andronicus, but nevertheless they are here. And so I want you to just think about this. Do we put them on the same plane as Peter and John and, and, and those fellows? Well, the word apostolos is used in a special sense that they are missionaries. They've been sent out by the church. Uh, turn to Philippians 2. Philippians 2. Philippians 2, look at verse 25. Yet I, I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my fellow worker and fellow soldier, but your messenger, there's your word, and the one who is ministered to my need. Now what's interesting about this ver this particular verse is this word messenger, that's our Greek word apostolos. Right? So if, if you look at the different translations, they all translate that particular word apostolos in, into messenger. So what's the point? The point here is that I think it's important for us to note how the word is used. I mean, it's obvious that there's something that distinguishes Peter and Paul um, and say, for example, John and the rest of the guys that we consider the original apostles with apostolic authority from men like Barnabas and Andronicus and Junius. So this kind of leads us to our third use of the word, the chosen twelve, right? In Galatians, Paul refers to himself as an apostle, and in his case, that refers to the select group of men that witness the resurrected Lord. John Stott said it this way, in this verse, Paul claims to be an apostle of Christ on a level with the twelve, whom Jesus named apostles with all teaching authority which this represents. And so the question arises, well, then what are the qualifications for an apostle in this sense, with true apostolic authority? Well, that answer is found in, in Acts 1, so let's turn over there. 
And let's see if Paul fits the criteria. Acts 1, verse 15. Now, they're trying to figure out what to do now that Judas is gone, right? So let's just pick up the reading in verse 15. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120. And he said, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who are arrested. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in, his, in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of the iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and his entrails gushed out. And he became known to those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that the field is called, in their own language, Akodama, that is the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate and, and let no one live in it and let another take his office. So therefore these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out and among us, beginning from the baptism of John to the day that he was taken up from us, uh, one must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed too, Joseph called Barsabbas, and who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen. To take part in this ministry, uh, the apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. All right, so here you know, we're seeing what are the qualifications of an apostle. Well, these passages are talking about how to replace Judas. And we see in verse 21, the candidate has to be a witness of Jesus, uh, uh, his resurrection, and be under his ministry. And in verse 22, we see that this person had to witness the resurrected Lord. So now here's the question. Does Paul fit within this description? Right? So let's go to Acts 9. Let's see the account of his conversion. Acts 9, look at verse 1. Then Saul, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near to Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around them from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goes. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the city, that you will be told, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And so the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire of the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying, and in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is my chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Well, here we see that Paul was chosen by Jesus to proclaim his name. And it's interesting to note that Lord, the Lord told Ananias that Paul was going to have to suffer for his name's sake. But the point here is that G, uh, Paul does see and witness the resurrected Lord. Now, Turn over to 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12. Second Corinthians 12, look at verse 11. He says, I have become a fool in boasting. You have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended by you, for in nothing I was behind the most eminent apostles, though I am nothing. Truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. For what is in for what is it in which you were inferior to other churches except that I myself was not a bur was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. 
And so in these verses, Paul is affirming his apostleship here. In verse 12, he's listing off the marks of an apostle. He says, look, God has testified of my work here through these signs and wonders that were done in your, in your presence. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Notice this. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which you also are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen by Cephas and then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom a greater part remained to the presence, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, uh, then by all the apostles, then last of all he was seen also by me as one born out of due time. For I am least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. But by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labor more abundantly than they all. Not I, but the grace of God which was in me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preached and so you believe. And so here we see that even in verse 7 that Jesus appeared to him as well. You know, Notice here uh, he, was witness, uh, he witnessed the resurrected Christ. And I want you to see one more thing. Go over to Galatians 1. We just read through it, but I want to point something out that you might have missed. Uh, Galatians 1 and verse 11. Notice here, he says, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me was not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. So where does it come from? If man did not teach Paul what he knows, then who taught him? But it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism. I have persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my father. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But notice this, I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went to Jerusalem to see Peter. So what we're reading here is that the gospel that Paul preached was not taught to him by man, but through revelation of Jesus Christ. And as a result, this qualifies Paul. He sees the resurrected Lord, and he sits under the ministry of the resurrected Lord. Okay. So it's interesting to note that Jesus' ministry lasted for three years, and Galatians 1.18 tells me that Paul was taught for three years. So as you begin to read through the New Testament, you see that Paul was the only um, apostle whose apostleship was always being challenged. I mean, you read through Acts 13, you see that uh, Antioch uh, sent him out, sent out Barnabas and Saul. During this time, Saul receives his Gentile name of Paul, and what that does is that signifies his ministry. Uh, he was going to proclaim the gospel message to the Gentiles. We see in Acts 13 that they leave. When they leave, Barnabas is the leader. However, on the return, Paul is the leader. So it's very significant when you look at the submissive attitude, particularly of Barnabas. But this gives you an idea of how this word apostolos is used. It's used in a general sense. In a general sense, all Christians have been sent to carry the Great Commission out to the nations. So in that sense, we're all apostles. We're all sent out ones. Uh, there's a very special sense where God raises up and calls missionaries to go out. You know, the church sends them out with a commission. And then there is this apostolic authority, this very unique uh, uh, office that is only given to a very select few. So, are there any apostles here today? Depends again on how we use the word, right? How we use it, the context in which we use it, in a general sense, we should all be. Uh, there may be, God may call you to be a missionary one day. He may call, raise you up to go send you out. That would be a, a use of that word. But if you say, is there anybody here with apostolic authority? No. They went away in the first century. Does that make sense? All right. Next, Galatians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So he moves from his calling to his credentials. So who gave him his credentials? Well, according to him, he says God did. Paul is affirming that his apostleship didn't come from men. It did not originate from any man but from God. He is affirming that his apostleship was not uh, mediated through any man but came directly from Christ Jesus. 
All right. And, and I think that's the same is true as well when, when, when we talk about those who have a call in their life for ministry work. Uh, I think that's true. Um, you know, the question is, well, how do you know if God's calling you into the ministry? Uh, well, I think there's an internal desire for it, and then there has to be an external call as well. In other words, the, the church should recognize the gifts and callings w- within your life. So, you know, for example, if, if you don't have a call to go into full-time ministry and the church tries to twist your arm to get you to go into it, uh, that could be problematic. And then likewise, if you think you've got a call but no one in the church recognizes it, well, then that's going to be problematic as well. So both need to be there, the internal and external call. Uh, the internal is the passion that God puts in, into you uh, to, to do his, his ministry work. And then the external call is the verification of the church who recognizes that call within you. No, next, notice his confidence. Galatians 1. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Uh, Paul tells us that his confidence was in God the Father who raises Jesus from the dead. The resurrection of the dead is very significant, as we'll see in the teachings of Paul within his letters. And it's interesting to note, um, Paul doesn't lay out his resume. Now, I want you to, this is so important. When Paul in his letter introduces himself, he doesn't tell you how many books he wrote. He doesn't tell you how many academic papers he's published. He doesn't tell you how many, brag about how many churches he starts. Nothing like that. He doesn't lay out his resume, right? He just simply says, I belong to God, right? Okay, so he doesn't lay out his resume. He tells us that his confidence you know, with respect to his ministry is that I'm just simply confident in the one who called me. My confidence is the one is in the one who raised Jesus from the dead. And that's where our confidence needs to be as well. Okay? Now, let's just talk about a, a few more notes about uh, Paul. Uh, some can read the different letters of Paul and conclude, you know, uh, he sure does seem to talk about his apostolic position a lot. So let's take a few minutes and address and look, look at this man a little bit closer. Uh, turn to Philippians 1. Philippians 1. And look at verse 12. He says, um, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which have happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord have become confident by my chains and are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So what has happened to Paul that he feels the need to encourage the people there uh, at the church of Philippi? I mean, he's sitting there in prison. But you know, despite the fact he's in prison, I love the fact. I love the idea here that he, um, where most of us would be discouraged, uh, and sitting there writing letters, you know, uh, having a pity party, right? He's encouraging this church. What's his focus upon? His focus here is upon the gospel message and that it's being spread. And this is a reminder to me: no matter where I'm at, where I find myself, uh, I can be used in the same way. I can share the gospel and encourage others to do the same. But that's the heart of Paul. Uh, Paul was not some tyrant sitting in the church. Uh, I believe he took the purity of the church very seriously, and that's why he writes some things that some you know he writes some things that people consider harsh at times. But I, I wanted you to just kind of see the heart of this man. Uh, this is a man who, yeah, I know he writes about his apostolic authority, but the reason why he was doing that is because he's being attacked by his enemies. Right? The enemies that are coming into the church of Galatia who were spreading Judaism, uh, legalism within there, distorting and perverting the gospel of grace. Uh, they were attacking, when they couldn't just attack his message, they tried to attack his person. Right? And so they're attacking his apostolic authority. And so he has to defend it. But I want you to see he's not defending that because he's saying, I'm the apostle. Now all you peasants bow down and do what I tell you. That, that's, not the way he's, that's not what he's doing here. He's defending his apostolic authority because it was under attack by those who were trying to undermine the gospel of grace. But I want you to see some of these notes about him, particularly in the, the letter of Philippians, about this man who is sitting in prison uh, is writing to encourage a church, don't let my chains discourage you. You keep pressing the claims of Christ. Turn over to 1 Timothy 1. 1 Timothy 1. Look at uh, verse 12. He says, And I thank Jesus Christ our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are Christ Jesus Christ. 
This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptance, that Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the chief. Now notice here, this is just a quick summary of Paul's life, isn't it? I mean, you look at his life before Acts 9. What do we know about Saul of Tarsus? Well, he was a terrorist. He literally terrorized the church. One pastor said that this man was a Bin Laden to the church. These verses are, are, are really what you see here as he writes this language. He's giving you evidence of a changed heart. So what changed Paul? Well, the answer is found within these verses, right? He, he said, I obtained mercy. I obtained grace. That's just poured out on me exceedingly and abundantly by God. And notice he's not using the word grace that, well, you know, God just winked at my sin. He didn't really care that I attacked the church. No, he changed me. I've been mercied. I've been graced, right? I, I've been changed from the inside out. So much so, this thing I tried to destroy, I'm now willing to be destroyed to promote its furtherance in the world. That's the kind of change. That's what takes place when God's grace consumes somebody. He obtained mercy. Grace was poured out on him exceedingly and abundantly by God. And so God took this man who was you know, rooted deep, steeped deep in, in Jewish tradition. He despised the Gentiles at one time. And then God took this man and changed his heart where he could even take, you know, if you read the, the, the book of 1 Timothy, he could even take this young Gentile man and say, that's my son. That's my true son in the faith. Turn to Romans 1. Turn to Romans 1. <coughs> Romans 1, verse 1 says, Paul, a doulos, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to, to the gospel of God. Just notice this word, servant of Jesus Christ. It's that word doulos, it literally means slave. And, and Paul takes on that position, that, that position of a servant, willingly. Right? Do you remember when Jesus comes to him as he's going there to attack and persecute the church? At the moment Christ calls out to him, and he looks to him and says, What do you want me to do, Lord? Right? It's at that moment Paul came to know him as his Savior and his Lord. And, and, and when Paul gets up, obeys the call of Jesus to go on to Damascus, Paul sees Jesus as his Lord and Master. He, Paul sees himself as the doulos, as the bondservant. I love what Dr. Ironside had to say in his commentary on Romans about Paul and this whole idea of a bondservant. He says, The writer Paul designates himself a servant, literally a bondman of Jesus Christ. He does not mean, however, that his was a service of bondage, but rather a wholehearted obedience of the one who realized that he'd been bought with a price, even the precious blood of Jesus. Do we as Christians today understand we have been bought by Christ? Since we have been bought by Him, we belong to Him. He owns us. All right. So the question for us, I think, is do we consider ourselves bond servants of Jesus Christ? So I understand the liberals want to attack Paul, attack the fact that he always is, is you know, kind of hammering on, I'm an apostle, I'm an apostle, but there's a reason why he's doing it. But you've got to look at the totality of his writings and recognize, now this is anything but a tyrant. He's a doulos. Okay? Let me show you something else about this man to reveal his character. Go to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9. Look at verse 1. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I'm not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord, and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? Whoever goes to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit, who tends a flock and does not drink the milk of the flock? Do I say these things as a mere man, or does the, not the law say the same thing also? For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle, a lot, muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. It is, oxen God is, is it oxen that God is concerned about? Or does he say it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt this is written, that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be partaker of, partakers of this hope. If we have sown spiritual things for you, it is a great thing if we reap your material things. If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Nevertheless, 
We've not used this right, but endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple, and those who serve the altar partake of the offerings of the altar? Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. But I have used none of these things, nor have I written these things, that it should be done so to me. For it would be better for me to die than anyone should make my boasting void. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have been entrusted with a stewardship. What is my reward then? That when I preach the gospel, I may present the gospel of Christ without charge, that I may not abuse my authority in the gospel. Well, so much for those who want to attack him for abusing his authority. He says, look, I've got the right to live off the gospel, but I've not taken that right because I don't want that to hinder the work of the gospel. Turn over to Acts 20. Acts 20. In Acts 20 and verse 17, notice here, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. So notice here, uh, Paul is about to go back to Jerusalem. Uh, he's pretty certain that when he goes there, he's going to get arrested. And so he's, he's going to say goodbye to these, these uh, Ephesian elders for the last time. But w- w- when he does this, he's giving them a warning as well. He, notice, he says here in verse 30, 32, drop down there. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus when he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Are you beginning to get a taste of the character of this man? Once again, he had every right as a minister of the gospel to expect support from these churches, but he did not exercise that right. Why? Well, he didn't want to be a burden to them. And think about this as we go through this letter to the Galatians. After all he did for them, some allowed, despite everything he did for them, some in that church allowed these false teachers to come in and smear his name, slander his character, and, and the church didn't do anything. The reason why he wrote this letter is they stood there silently while these Judaizers came in there and slandered this humble man who never took anything from them. And so we need to be careful once again, right? It's easy to forget. Um, it's e- think about the men in your past, the men who have labored in your past. It's easy to forget about them, isn't it? It's always been a blessing for me to go back and tell men who I look back and see what God did and how he used them. It is always a blessing to go back to them. We had a great opportunity a few months back uh, when we were in Mississippi uh, just to go spend time with a, a pastor, dear man in the faith, that pours so much into my life. You know, it's easy to forget about everything they labored for in your life in those days. And so just remember those men. If you, if you can't get to them, you know, send them a note. If you can't uh, reach them on the phone, pray for them, right? But remember those faithful men who have been in your life, all throughout your life, encouraging you in the faith. And, and this is so easy to forget them. It's easy to also, I think, have an entitlement mentality as though, well, you know, these men owed it to me. <laughs> they didn't owe you anything. They're just being obedient to their Savior. They're being obedient to bring you the word of truth. Well, I think Paul is a great case study of a man who's been broken by God, uh, who, who now demonstrates the highest level of humility and moral character. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop here. Lord willing, I'm going to pick up next time, and I'm going to deal with Paul, and I want to deal with his teachings. I want to just hit some of the high points of his teachings because... You know, uh, if we want to understand this man and what he's going to be writing in, in Galatians, uh, I think it's good for us to see his views on God. I think it's um, you know it'd be good for us to understand his view on uh, the nature of man and the dilemma that sin brings and what is his remedy for that. I, I think it's interesting to take a look at his views on Christ uh, as a converted Jew. It's very interesting to see his views of the Messiah. Also, I want us to see and look at his doctrine of redemption. I want us to look at Paul's doctrine of the cross. And then I want, finally I want us to see, uh, well, there's two more things. I want to see how uh, Paul views the resurrection of Christ and its importance in the Christian faith. And then I want to take a look at his views of the church. So, Lord willing, we'll pick up here next week and I'll, we'll take a look at what this man taught. It'll kind of be a broad overview. And then we'll talk about the week after we'll deal with the audience 
Then we'll look at the reason why Paul wrote the letter, and then we'll be ready to get into the letter. All right. So continue to read through Galatians in preparation for our time together, and let us pray that God will. Uh, this letter will be a benefit to us, in, and also as we go through it, I want us to challenge ourselves: Have we trusted in a true gospel? Uh, we'll make sure we haven't believed in a false gospel. Okay. Because Paul's going to be very adamant. It, it just look, one, one more thing. Let me just show you how serious Paul takes a, a false gospel. Uh, notice the anathema that, that he gives. He says here in verse 8, well, just look at verse 6. I marvel, Galatians 1, 6, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And as we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. That's pretty strong language that Paul uses there for those who bring a false gospel. Uh, it's not a light thing to bring a, a, you know, to pervert the gospel, to change its contents. Uh, many people have been led astray over the centuries through a false gospel. And so we want to make sure we haven't responded to a false gospel. And so we want to compare the gospel we responded to to what Paul teaches. And we want to make sure we're not guilty of promoting a false gospel as well. So uh, I think this book is, is very important, timely for us as a church to look at to make sure we understand the true gospel of grace. So Lord willing, we'll pick up here next week. All right. All right, so let's get ready for the Lord's table.